Oh, Hi everybody, and welcome so much to the 1000 Nights uh, panel at Small Press Expo. Uh, we are so grateful to SPX for hosting us, and as you can see, there are a lot of uh, people on the panel. Surprise! Before we get started, I just want to give a little bit of housekeeping. Again, thank you so much to SPX for having us. This is absolutely incredible. And thank you so much to the volunteers who are here helping us. Like, big round of applause, you guys. You have a long day ahead of you. <laughs> just so you are uh, in the know, this panel is being recorded. Uh, if you have any questions, please hold off to the end, and we will have microphones available for you to speak into. Please use the microphones, otherwise we won't be able to hear you. Um, all right, so without further ado, let us introduce ourselves. Uh, my name is Annie Stoll, and- I'm Kevin Stanton. Uh, we are the co-curators of 1001 Nights. Um, it's a massive people-positive anthology. Um, how many of you in the room have heard of it before? So a lot of you guys, welcome. And so for those of you who don't know, um, it's a three-volume set. We actually have one of the first uh, advanced copies here for you to check out. Um, there are over 260 artists in this book. Um, it's people positive. The prompt to all the artists was, what does it mean to be a knight? What does it mean to have strength? And the um, resulting art from this book uh, spans the gamut. It's comics, it's illustration, there's a puppet, there's a cactus, there's a bug, uh, there's illustration. You name it, it's in here. It's diverse. All kinds of body types, all kinds of genders, and just anything and everything is in this book, and it's been wonderful to see this come together. The heart of this book is the artists who are in here. Uh, we as co-curators played a small role in making this happen. Silence your cell phones, please. <laughs> um, and really what we wanted to talk and have this panel about was to bring awareness to some of these amazing artists and talk about their art and their work through the lens of this project. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, introduce several of these artists to you. And then we're going to have each of the artists go around and tell you a little bit about their work. And from there, we're going to go and talk about um, some questions. And at the end, if you have anything you want to add or questions you want to ask, please feel free. Transitions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're all going to be like, hey. <laughs> Um, so here are our house crests. This is just a little introduction for those of you who are unfamiliar. Uh, there's three separate volumes. It's full color, 7 by 10 inches, hardcover, cloth bound, 250 pages plus in every single volume, 260 artists actually. Over 1,001 characters are represented, including the artists in the book. Um, and this is our little blurb. Uh, it's very wordy. You can read it online. Um, basically what I just told you about what the book is about. Um, if you want to see a complete list of the artists, please go on our website, 1001nights.com. Spelled out, not, uh, Spelled not out. the numbers. <laughs> <laughs> and here's like a little sample of just kind of giving you a crazy idea of all of the art that is in the book. Just all kinds of amazing uh, perspectives and styles. Um, and as we mentioned, uh, the book is people positive. And uh, to give you a little information about what that is, um, Basically, we would define it as being accepting, opening, and championing people of all gender IDs, orientations, races, cultures, and beliefs. There we go. We can all do that, right? All encompassing. <laughs> we can all. We can all. <laughs> Hi. So this is me. Um, uh, I'm a grammy nominated art director, and I do a lot of cool stuff. And on to the next five. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this is Kevin. <laughs> Kevin is a freelance illustrator with a green thumb who likes to keep busy. Uh, he grew up on military bases but spent his childhood. You don't have to read the whole thing. <laughs> Please stop. Um, I was very lucky to work with Ryan North on uh, a comic, uh, so that was my, my particularly special part of this. But um, yeah, we can, we can move on. All right. And you can see that each slide has um, people's works next to it. So um, Alex is not here. isn't here yet. Please let's send some good vibes to her. Her plane. Uh, She's not coming. Is, yeah, got delayed. <laughs> she, she missed the plane. Um, so <laughs> love to Alex. I know. <laughs> Alex, we love you. Um, next is Alex Menchie Lee. 
Um, Alice is a bisexual illustrator oh, who grew up in, <laughs> yes, actually, uh, Detroit and makes art for publishers and galleries. Her work draws inspiration not only from her family's traditional Chinese roots, but also her lifelong studies in astrology and mysticism. You can follow her on Twitter or visit her site, and I'll let Alice tell you what those sites are. Um, I'm at Alice Michi on Twitter, and alicemichi.com is my website. All right. Next up, we have Barbara Perez Marquez. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, Barbara. Hello. <laughs> I, I, I am. So Barbara is a writer. Her work usually revolves around coming of age and LGBTQ themes. Uh, she draws infra- inspiration from personal experiences and her love for magical realism. Currently, she is the writer and co-creator of The Order of the Belfry. Please let everyone know uh, your social media. Uh, yeah, you can find me at Mustache Babs on Twitter, uh, the Instagram, that thing, and mustachebabs.com is my website. And then we have uh, Nika. Nika is otherwise known as Nika. Her real name is Deandra. <laughs> I've only ever known her on the internet as Nika, and so you have to apologize for me just always calling her that forever. Um, she lives in DC by way of New York, and she's an artist and writer whose stories, more often than not, deal with adventure and romance. When not working on comics, she is probably procrastinating on working on comics by mapping, <laughs> eating pizza, or taking long walks while playing Pokemon Go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Please let us know about your social media. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> All right, I think the easiest is just to go to my website, which is nikacomics.com, and Nika is spelled N-I-K-A. <laughs> Next, we have Jen Liv. Uh, Jen is a freelance illustrator based in Toronto who mainly has done work for editorial publications. Her clients include the New York Times, TED, NPR, and Plan Sponsor. Occasionally, she likes to print things through Riso <laughs> and make comics. Um, please ask me your social media. Um, Twitter, I'm Chemical Color, and Instagram, GenLive, and Tumblr, GenLive. Yeah. Woo. All right. Julia? Yes. Me. Julia Scott <laughs> uh, is an illustrator and a colorist from Baltimore, Maryland. She has worked with Arcadia, Boom, Lionforge, CBK, uh, Oni, and Oni Press. She daily pursues her hardcore villain fetish and every possible platform. <laughs> Currently direct your bereft wailing to her social media and her webcomic, The Telegraph Generation. And let us know your media, please. Uh, it is The Telepath Generation. Yes. Uh, and that's my webcomic, which is also my website, telepath-generation.com. Uh, it is a comic written also by the wonderful Josh Tierney of uh, Spira Lore. Um, and my Twitter is at Julia Snop. Also Instagram. I love that, guys. Josh is also in 2001. Just like the, you know, oh, yeah. represent. Josh, Josh is also a writer in our book. <laughs> yeah. All right. We're done. So next is Kata Kane. Hi. <laughs> um, Kata is a comics creator, illustrator, designer, and art director. She's best known for her ongoing webcomic series, Alter Girl, and her newest book with paper cuts, Anna and the Cosmic Race, a sci-fi and romance adventure that is debuting here at SPX. She's contributed to comics anthologies like A Thousand One Nights, Dirty Diamonds, and Lady Night Anthology. Her comics and style are inspired by shoujo manga with a focus on storytelling for all ages, especially young female readers. And where can we find you? Um, Twitter is kata underscore kane, and my website is kata dash kane, and uh, my uh, webcomic Alter Girl is alter dash girl dot com. All right. All right, Ian. Ian's not here currently, but he, he's tabling. He's around. So, so check there. Ian out at his awesome table. <laughs> <laughs> Which is um, D5 yeah. with yeah. Alec McGovern. Who's yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yes, we have we maps have map. as well. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you all have maps. Yes, in front of you is a map. Uh, we've kind of taken this convention by storm. Um, next is Meridal Newton. Uh, Meridal Newton is a researcher and writer in Washington, D.C. She has a book available wherever fine books are sold and occasionally produces short stories. She writes science fiction and fantasy with a particular emphasis on fairy tale themes. And where can we find you? You can find me at my website, which is thepublickingdom.com, and I'm relatively active on Twitter, which is Riddle, R-I-D-E-L-E-E. Yes. All right. Uh, Paulina Kim? Uh, is a freelance comic and storyboard artist, currently a colorist for Kazukibishi's Amulet, and on the side she draws a webcomic called Discord Rhapsody. 
Really, she's inspired by books, manga, and the growing list of peculiar events that she has experienced so far. Like recently, I just got lost, like I got locked in a library and they couldn't help us because there's the bi- big wildfires oh. in LA. So they're like, they let you burn. They were just like, yeah, we can't send you the police. So try to break yourself out. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> So that's what we had to do. <laughs> but uh, you can find me at um, all my t- all my social media handles is Milk Doggy and <laughs> oh D O G G I E. Yep. And if you want to check out my web comic, it's a musical instrument fighting web comic called Discord Rhapsody. So yeah. All right. <laughs> so sad. Uh, next we have Rachel L. Cohen. Uh, Rachel is an illustrator designer from the DC metro area. Her influences mainly come from sources of fantasy, sci-fi, and various forms of animation from Disney to anime and manga. While those influences come into play in tandem with her passion and artwork surrounding the world of ice hockey, she also uses them to create her own characters and stories. And where can we find you? You can find me on Twitter at cat with a K, so K-A-T-326. I'm also on Instagram as cat326. I am on Tumblr as CapsCat26, and my main website is rlcohenart.com. And also, if you're a big hockey fan and here in the D.C. area, I do work for the Caps blog, Russian Machine Never Breaks. (laughs) Next we have Shannon Wright. Shannon is an illustrator and cartoonist working in Richmond, Virginia. Her artwork tends to be inspired by what's making her happy or stressed at the time or specific nostalgic moments. You can find her yelling about fan fiction on Twitter, and you can find her work on her website. And what are those lovely sites? Okay, uh, my, my Twitter, Tumblr, and Instagram is at Shannon Drew This. So straight to the point, I just, <laughs> I do that. And then my uh, website is shannonwright.com, but it's shannon-wright.com. And next we have Zachary Clemente. Clemente. <laughs> Who made it? Who made it? I'm so excited. <laughs> um, Zach is a comics writer and event organizer in Boston. He's a self-published, slowly growing series of sci-fi vignettes and has worked on the planning committee for the Massachusetts Independence Comics Expo for the past four years. And where can we find you online? So my Twitter is Clemente Works. My website is Clemente.Works. <laughs> and my defunct, very defunct Tumblr is Clemente Works. <laughs> <laughs> and we also have a special treat for you. We have a surprise secret guest, which is Jennifer Zarin. <laughs> oh, and since I don't have a slide for you, you have to introduce yourself. Oh. Hi, I'm Jennifer Zyron smith um, I do a webcomic called LaSalle's Legacy, which is about pirates and necromancy. Um, you can find that one at LaSalle'sLegacy.com. You can also find me at Instagram and Twitter at Jennifer Zyron. And I love all things fantasy sci-fi. Woo-hoo. All right, so that has been the first 15 minutes. Um, but that gives you a little bit of an indication of how this uh, project has been. There are so many different amazing voices, and everyone has a really great perspective. Um, so I wanted to kind of start this out by talking with um, all of our artists a little bit about uh, their process for answering the question, what does it mean to be a knight, and how that worked uh, into their process and their work uh, in the collection. So uh, if you want to just, anyone who wants to start and say, it doesn't have to go down the line, does anyone who has any thoughts, uh, talk a little bit about your work in relation to uh, the anthology. I'll start. Um, sure. Let's get to use the mic. Sure. Oh, yeah, oh, okay, we'll use this mic. <laughs> so, uh, Thousand One Nights was my first ever like published anthology, um, and when t- thinking about what is a night, I immediately went to Alana of Trevon, who was like a big. Her books were a big influence on me growing up, and I started thinking about some of the characters I've created um, over the years. And one character, who the purple-haired character you saw on my slide, her name is Smadar, and she was a character I created when I was about. 14 or 15 uh, based on a character creation contest a friend of mine had made and I had come in I think second or third place and so I decided I started had right I had started writing a story for her she was a bodyguard to a princess on another planet and that story fell through because I went off to college and life happened and school happened and so I decided to revisit her character and take it from more of a sci-fi like more bodyguard type to she's the champion of the queen. Um, she was created by the skeleton witch to t- 
take over the kelp, take over the kingdom, but instead she fell in love with the queen instead. So when the skeleton witch wants revenge, she has to go back to f face her fears of the one who made her this like monster lion type m character and um, save the one she loves the most. So, so it's just kind of the whole point with, of thinking about strength is strength through through overcoming your fear and strength through love and how in the end love will always win. Amen. So actually, um, my story is similar to um, what Rachel was just saying. Um, I took a character that I made up in high school um, who was um, a princess who chose to become a knight. And I think that, you know, you can say that that's kind of a typical story, but I like the kind of stories that can kind of resonate with a lot of people. Um, but yeah, just taking a character from, you know, like a, a formative time in your life and, you know, thinking about what you want to become and how to become that. So I think that's really cool that, like, I kind of had the same thing where I was like, oh, I have this character. And, and the other characters were kind of based on friends, too, like even the little butterfly girl who's, like, only on that page. But I was like, I got to throw her in there. <laughs> like, I, like, this is, like, the first page of the comic. And I was like, I just have to include all of these characters that, you know, I made up in my notebooks in high school and just kind of revisit them and, and see how they've grown and how I've grown, like, since then, too. So, yeah, similar. <laughs> Yeah. So I have a slightly different process in that I, I did have characters that existed, but at the time I was working on this high school romance that was very shoujo-esque, <laughs> and I wanted to do something really different because I'm, I, I'm still kind of in the process of figuring out what are the kind of stories I want to tell, who are the characters I want to tell them through. and. I loved the idea of knights because I also grew up reading about Alana and, you know, um, dealing with dragons and all that fun stuff. But I wanted to try and t turn it into something slightly different, so I made it sci-fi and just went out on a limb there. Was a, this is my first sci-fi comic ever. Um, I wanted to have fun with it. And it was a little bit terrifying, I will say, because if you've never done sci-fi, there's a lot of work that has to go into it, into like thinking through how things work. And pretty soon into it, I felt completely out of my depths. But you know, Annie and Kevin have been incredibly supportive throughout the whole process, and it just ended up being a really fun opportunity to play and explore. Um, with the topic at hand, I went less with uh, what does it mean to be a knight and more so um, who's allowed to be a knight and I took the I decided to um, portray a black woman as a knight and I don't get to see a lot of us represented in fantasy and if we are we're very like, stereotyped to a certain role I also dedicated like my knight my knighthood to my dad and all his old PC games he used to play <laughs> that I would just sit and watch and he would get so giddy being able to like create his character so it was something to be able to create a black knight in video games but not see them portrayed in media so I was like yo I want to be a knight <laughs> I want this girl to have bantu knots <laughs> so that's what I did and I was like I'm just as much as a knight as anyone else, and just as badass, so that's what I did. Oh, yeah. 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 I don't have a... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You want to go? Oh, yeah. If that's okay. Yeah, no. <laughs> See, I don't have a... You don't have a slide for me, but my knight was also black. Um, she was based off of a friend of mine from Scotland, um, and originally my story was I, I was thinking about um, doing a high fantasy, because even though I love pirates, I also love, like, high fantasy. And I wanted to um, explore characters from the next webcomic I want to work on. And uh, my character, Zias, um, came to me. And she is a sort of peasant girl and trying to become a knight. But in my world, I discovered that, you know, knights were all these um, rich people. And they didn't like her because she wasn't rich. And, and you'll read the story, but I sort of explored that and had her meet her partner, who they're going to go on adventures with later. But that was sort of my opportunity to explore the next characters I want to work with. 
Uh, dude, chops, uh, by the way, to everybody who did a full-length comic for this. <laughs> Um, thematically, I guess my approach um, was a little bit different. A couple of years ago, I curated a zine called Lady Knight's Women Warriors with um, Roxy Viscara and Abby Bay. And so I had kind of already gone through the process of trying to come up with a story to go with a, a traditionally represented knight. And so when it came to this project, when, when Annie and Kevin um, invited me very kindly to be a part of it, I knew I wanted to do something different. Uh, and so my piece is totally standalone, um, and I decided that I wanted to embrace in my piece some, some of my thinking as an artist in general at the time. Uh, and I politically, philosophy-wise, philosophy kind of lean a little bit closer to um, nihilis nihilism. Uh, nihilist existentialist, but not like a turdy way, like or like <laughs> nihilist light. Um, Thank you for the distinction. Yeah, there's this 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 dope thing about Camus that I really like, where it's like, yeah, he's like, oh, nothing matters, everybody dies one day, but uh, he's all about the idea that uh, you create your own meaning for things in small moments. Like you see that the sun is really beautiful, or one day you feel the wind and it's so soft on your cheeks, or you see a beautiful woman. And in that moment, that is what matters about being alive. And so there's something um, really tasty to me about pregnant moments. And so for my piece, um, I think that kids uh, can more easily access that um, that special moment that kind of like floats ethereal and is special for no other reason than that's the moment that you're with your friends. And um, in this piece, um, they are heroes. And it's, it's fleeting. And it's um, super temporary. And they're all together. And you know, I, I try to draw kids that I would have been friends with at that age as well. And so it really it comes from, from the spirit of friendship, um, which to me um, echoes the sentiment of the book so well. It's so cool to see so many different kinds of people working together. And um, I guess that was the, the condensation of my idea for my piece. Con con what was, it, was that the right word? Condensation? No. It, it felt right. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah. It certainly makes yeah. sense. And um, for those of you who don't know, the book is divided into three different uh, volumes. So one is courage, one is wisdom, and one is fellowship. And so there's sort of stories that when you get a group of people together, you see these overarching themes. And for us, that was a way to sort of organize it, but also be kind of like fun, like Harry Potter, where you've got the rival houses <laughs> of the book. Friendly, friendly rivals. No, no fighting. Does anyone else have anything they wanted to add on that question? Uh, yeah. Oh, keep going. Yeah, cause let's, let's keep going. <laughs> so yeah, when I thought about strength, um, the first thing that comes to my mind is my family. And my dad was like a refugee from China because he was starving to death. He was like five foot nine and like 92 pounds at one point. So he and a bunch of friends decided, OK, we can't stay here or else we'll die. So we'll train until we can swim for eight hours straight. So they swam across the bay from China to Hong Kong to escape death. And he, he like had nothing but a knife in his mouth to protect himself from barracudas and border patrol and, <laughs> and his pair of shorts. Um, so that's all he took with him to Hong Kong to like start a new life. And oh, not to mention the fact that he also like when he was like going through the forest that divided like um, China, like his city and Hong Kong, he had to like sleep in cemeteries and like he saw some real shit that day like, <laughs> and started like doing superstitious things to like keep the ghosts from following him out of the cemeteries and stuff like. So I I grew up with like all this like Chinese folklore about how you have to wear certain medals to protect you from like spirits and and all this um, all these fairy tales about. Um, you know, rabbits on the moon who in Japanese folklore are pounding mochi, but in Chinese folklore they're pounding like medicine for eternal life for all the gods. Um, so, and I also grew up watching like VHS tapes of like Chinese New Year celebrations where they do the dragon dance and the dragons always look like they're going after like a moon or a sun and, um, and they're threatening to swallow it. So, I know in other Asian folklores, like dragons swallowing the moon, like cause eclipses. So that's kind of part of the idea for my piece, is that this dragon is about to swallow the moon, and the rabbit on the moon is a knight who is defending it, and 
is going to defeat the dragon and uh, stop the eclipse from happening. Um, so yeah, that's my influences. And it's kind of like a spiritual sequel to another piece I did about um, Chang'e, who's like the goddess of the moon, who's, com who's a companion to the rabbit. And I did that for uh, Dark Horse Comics, um, what was it called? Uh, Once Upon a Time Machine, where, where you take like a folklore and then you put like a futuristic sci-fi spin on it. So that's kind of, it kind of lives in the same world as, as that piece and, and that kind of like modernized like Chinese folklore. So from the South to the Ridiculous, um, my piece, I had actually started it uh, long before I'd heard about the anthology and had it's a short story that I had started after I'd finished my novel, which is a very modernized urban fairy tale sort of story. And I decided I wanted to do something much more traditionally fairy tale like when I started this. And I was actually exploring the idea of strength as what is an archetypal princess, what is an archetypal knight, and how do the boundaries blur between them. So the story starts out very uh, almost stereotypically with the, with the knight promising to take on a quest to defend the princess. But then the princess decides to tag along, and as the story goes along, she becomes the strong one that actually ends up solving the issue and, and answering the questions and, and figuring out what's going on. And that, to me, was what I was trying to communicate, was that there are many different ways to be strong. There are many different ways to be uh, feminine, because the knight is also a woman. But uh, and overall, it takes everyone. It takes all different kinds to, to get through life and to solve things. <laughs> um. Yeah, and continuing on the writing bandwagon, I also have uh, writing in the anthology. I'm in the Courage um, volume. And the prompt itself, I have two pieces. And one of them, I was like, you know, I want to explore this fantasy, usual expectations of the uh, night. And then I made her evil, because why not? <laughs> um, and then I was like, cool, that's a great piece and all. But then I had this moment with the prompt that was really personal. And so I have this really short poem about what it means to be a knight in your personal life. So it's like really short, but it's like the idea that all these fantasy, you know, armor and like a sword at ready, killing dragons are all these things that we face in real life. And the armor is like all these defenses we create as a person. So. That's like really intricate, like really composed, like compressed into like this really short poem. So it's the duality that presented itself with the prompt and with the anthology and, and the project that um, really inspired me with my pieces. I'm into that. That sounds cool. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's good. Well, where did that come from? <laughs> I think we should get all the writers in one go. Um, <laughs> So I also uh, wrote, I worked with um, my friend Ricardo Lopez Ortiz, uh, who did the art for this. Um, just the last one, Annie. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I realized halfway through that there's a panel that I can click on all of you for. <laughs> so I apologize for the delay. Yeah, so it was actually kind of a happy accident. I was one of the earliest people to sign up for 1001 Nights when they first announced it, but I didn't have any idea what I was going to do. Uh, nor was I sure that I even... We didn't either, so it's great. Well, yeah, yeah. I, I, was, I, mean, I wasn't sure that I would even do a comic. This is sort of a happy accident where Ricardo and I were working on something, and both of us signed up for this project, and neither of us knew what we were going to do for the project, and we realized what we were working on fit 100% into it. So we kind of just threw it in there, and it worked really well. Um, but the, I, the idea of this is uh, it's sort of built around um, this is a big, big, sprawling story I'm trying to tell, and it's too open and wide and vast, so I'm doing a bunch of vignettes that sort of create foundational moments and narratives and like plot pieces for me to actually tell a bigger story out of. So this character is someone who is, she's, she's definitely like a, not a placeholder at all, and she definitely has a, a huge purpose in this, in this universe, but she doesn't have a name yet. No one has a name yet, um, and that's okay, because five people read the script. Do any of us, <laughs> huh? do any of us have a name? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we do. <laughs> no, no. Uh, my name is Zach. <laughs> Come on, dog. Um, but it, it's, it's exploring the idea of um, power as a universal force that humans or people of human nature can't fully control. And to use it, whether for good or for ill, is self-destructive. Um, and this is an example of someone using it for what they believe is good, but maybe. I don't know. We'll see. By the book. <laughs> Um, I actually joined in the project very last minute, and I was like, wow, this seems really cool. And then when I tried to think of a prompt, I was sitting there at my desk being like, 
oh my god, I don't know what a knight is. <laughs> because, I, cause I'll explain, because I come from a, from a Korean household and uh, we never really grew up with the traditional idea of what knights are. We usually go like, oh, you have like swordsmen and you have these like officers who like protect the king and the queen. So with my piece, I actually looked through so a lot of period pieces and I had a queen's servant who was, uh, where the castle was being destroyed and she decides to pick up a slain officer and protect the queen herself. So that's the kind of look in, uh, I went for this one. And uh, yeah, so kind of like, I kind of see that as a way of strength in a way where you know you're kind of pinned in a corner, but sometimes you gotta just pick it up and just do it, you know? So yeah. Okay. <laughs> you must. Yeah. Um, I think so for my piece, when I got invited to do this, I was really stoked because I saw this as an opportunity to just like kind of go nuts and just do something I wanted to draw for a change instead of following a brief. So yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think at the time, like I'm a huge anime nerd, so I really wanted to draw like Yankees or like some like badass, like, you know, like that kind of hair and stuff. I'm really into that kind of thing. <laughs> so I think for me, uh, strength is like having the strength to be yourself. Like for me, I'm always like, you know, trying to fit in, trying to pretend to be someone I'm not. Um, and it took me a long time to just accept like, I really like loving myself, I guess. So I wanted to show like an Oni mask because I really love those masks. Um, I see it as like concealing her identity, so I wanted to show her like kind of like being really badass and just smashing it and like, you know, kind of going against like trying to put up a facade all the time. Um, and yeah, I think at the time I was like really into Attack on Titan, so I wanted to <laughs> <laughs> like play with the whole like like different scales, like, you know, small versus big and just show like like kind of add to that uh, fighting against something larger than yourself and overcoming things. Yeah. This limited palette is also really nice. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> We've gotten through everybody. Um, Indeed. I think I wanted to talk a little bit also about the idea of like people positivity and like how that is a part of your world and your work, and maybe talk a little bit about moving forward from this project. Like, how has that influenced your work, or how has people positivity been incorporated into your work before and after? Um, I know for me, this project kind of opened up some doors for a series that I just decided to start. It's like a uh, amazing series. Yes. Thank you. Also, I just want to add, Shannon sometimes talks about introducing her dad to anime, and it is. Oh my best. god, you guys would love <laughs> my dad. My dad would love you. If you haven't followed her yet, do it now. Yeah, you <laughs> just, you, she I, can I just have to throw that in. My, so my dad could be all your dads. <laughs> <laughs> He's a good guy. Um, oh god, now I just want to talk about my dad. Um, <laughs> but. Huh? How many dads can your dad take in a fight? Oh, all dads. He's, he's, my dad is actually a wizard, so there's that. He's, so, sorry, I'm going to like go on a tangent about my dad. Awesome. He's, um, he's growing his hair out and stuff, so now his hair's like down here, and it's, it's like, um, it was like all black, but now he's getting that silvery. And uh, now he has a he has a beard too. So I'm trying to convince him to like cosplay with me. And so I'm trying to like do um, from Pokemon Sun and Moon. I'm a uh, Hal, and then he's like the grandpa. So I was <laughs> so well, we're, we're gonna work it out. We're gonna work it out. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, this project definitely um, kind of kickstarted a new project. I started um, that um, explores uh, black hair, and uh, the series right now is called uh, Color Me Black. You can buy. You can get it at my table at E10. And when I did this piece, I like, put it out and I was like, I've never drawn any characters with like any Bantu knots and stuff. And I see a lot of I see a lot of people when they draw black characters specifically, they're just like, well, I don't know what black people look like. <laughs> so we, we get we get like the generic like uh, high top, uh, afro puff, afro. Um, what else do we get? Like, yeah, like dreads that are not drawn really well. And so I was like, let me save, let me save uh, illustration. And uh, so that's what I, that's what I did. And I took off on this and I posted it online. 
And the next thing I know, um, I did this, and then I did another one, and then I did another one, and I was like, oh, I really like this. And then Ebony Magazine hit me up, and they're like, hey, we like this hair series. Can we do an article on you? And I was like, yeah. And so, 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 that, so, that, so that's what happened. And I was like, oh, God, I got to keep this going. Because she was like, oh, what's this going to be? I'm like, it's for a hair series. And so I was like, shit, I got to do more. And so, because um, I was like, yeah, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be pretty big. And I was like, fuck, I only have five. Um, so I wish I had five more. So that's the first volume. And, um. Yeah, this project really opened that up, and I'm very grateful to uh, Annie and Kevin. I view them as my mom and my dad. Aww. And uh, yeah, my other dad. Um, not, not as cool. Not, not, I, no. My dad would really love you, Kevin. Aww. God. Okay. I see yeah. the family resemblance in the hair. I, <laughs> no, yeah, that's my mom. <laughs> Took her good uh, fact and sense from her. But yeah, sorry, I'm done rambling. I've been talking like that all day. Yeah. Um, Oh, oh, you go. No, yeah. No, no. Okay. Um, so, A Thousand and One Nights was really, um, it also opened some, some doors. Um, before the project, I, I had been doing mainly the hockey stuff. And while I'd been having some like science fiction and fantasy influences, it had very much been sports, 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 all 24-7. And then also in my, my, my day job was I was a sign artist for a grocery store. So it was just produce and sports. Um, <laughs> so it was a good chance to like just write, revisit an old character and write a story. And it really brought out, made me want to do more original stories and um, fantasy and that like. So I ended up combining the, the two about six months later. And I did medieval fantasy style uh, banners for every NHL team in the league. And that got picked up by USA Today. Um, I was actually at work at the time, and my phone is just like I going off, off, like buzz, 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 buzz. My first thought is somebody is dead. <laughs> and I look, and it's like, you have 100 new Twitter notifications. And I was just like, did I die? <laughs> Today, I'd retweeted the picture, and it had just gone gone viral. Um, so I've been doing a lot of, a lot of that since, and I'm currently brainstorming a sequel to, to my story. It's called Blossom Lion because the character Smadara, her name means blossom in Hebrew. Um, she's based off one of my Jewish summer camp uh, counselors, who was one of the most badass women I've ever met in my life. Um, and wanting to go more into their story. And they're like after the skeleton, which is defeated. What what this? I'm working on giving her a squire, who was also created by the skeleton witch. Um, it's still very much in in pre development, but um, I would love to be able to share more of their story someday. Mm, promotion. <laughs> <laughs> Network. Oh, also you can find me at <laughs> at I eleven B. If you can find me at I11B, I do have all those banners I did on display at my table. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, when it comes to people positivity, the other thing that Thousand One Nights did was friendship. <laughs> I mean, like being able to talk, process with everybody, find out that you're in the same anthology, despite the fact that some of us have never seen each other's real faces. It's super awesome. It's like a look cool secret club that's not secret because we want everybody to be in it. We're like, no, let me tell you about this thing because I want you too to be happy in your life. <laughs> so it, it's open, like, you know, I'm going to resonate. It's like opening a lot of doors, like networking, whether it's like friendships or just like cool people to follow on Twitter with their cool dad stories. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and then for like myself specifically, it allowed for, um, you know, opening a project, I write The Order of Belfry, which is a Lady Nights comic that somebody's, you know, it's just like, oh, I think remotely you like Lady Nights. Like, remotely, have you seen me? Um, so yeah, so that's going on, and I'm at E5, if you want a poster, it's got ladies kissing, and hey, they're in armor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and again, please make sure you guys check out this map. You can find out where all of these amazing people are. Also, table E is kind of almost all knights. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm going to follow up on that and uh, shout out uh, Kevin and Annie for being uh, incredibly transparent and forward yes. with the way that they yes. organized yes. this project. Yeah. They were giving us updates. Uh, they were giving us visuals. 100% um, any questions that we had, they were super good at uh, giving us feedback. And uh, one of the biggest problems that I encounter, I don't encounter a lot of problems uh, in the illustration slash comics business, but the one that I do find mo most often bothers me is uh, we have a tendency, because it's a small market, to throw each other some shade sometimes. <laughs> and uh, that's super reductive and just not helpful. So a project like this, especially because it was so transparent, because we saw constant visual updates and knew exactly where everybody was, mm -hmm. uh, that gave me an opportunity to go check out a bunch of new people's work and make a bunch of new friends on the internet that I subsequently can now be friends with in real life. <laughs> and it's excellent. Like, what is the best thing about being in any community is, like, sharing ideas and, um, like, getting to know somebody else's uh, perspective. So uh, your transparency super helped out with that. Thank Thanks, you. guys. Mm -hmm. Thank you, guys. So I want to add on to that really quickly. <laughs> really quickly. Um, it's been amazing because if you're wondering why a lot of these knights are women or, you know, very femme, it's because this originally started as, like, a Game of Thrones yeah. fanzine. Yeah. So it's come a long way because as more people got added, you know, Annie and Kevin realized that there are a lot of different stories that people wanted to tell that could be told, and they just completely opened it up, and they made it people positive by, you know, saying it doesn't, they don't have to be a lady knight, even though a lot of them ended up being lady knights. It can be whatever you think a knight is. And so when I think about how 1001 Nights has been people positive, I just think about how they basically just gave this really open prompt and let people run with it. So. Well, thank you guys. Yeah, <laughs> it means a lot. Um, so in that spirit, I wanted to open it up with a little bit of time uh, for questions. If anyone in the audience has any questions they want to ask real quick. Anybody? Anybody? Please, please ask questions. <laughs> please. How's your day? It's great. I'll, I'll, I'll start with a photo. Oh, yeah, go for it. Um, I'll start. I think there are there's, mics. there's mics. Well, I think they want you for the mics. For it's the recording. It's recording. There's one right there. Oh, wait. Is that Courtney? Yeah. Oh, hey, Courtney. Hey, Emily. Hey. Wait, you have to talk in the mic so they can yeah, record you. There's one right there. There's Sorry, one. we're making we're making you do the Comic Con. Like, I have I have a question in ten parts, please. <laughs> hey, Court. I'm Shannon. We're getting coffee on Wednesday. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, well, so I guess after I had to get up, I just really wanted to ask, are you gonna make another? <laughs> oh, this? Um, really? No. no. <laughs> um, I mean, I think that this has taught us so much. We have learned so much. We have met so many amazing people. And it really has become an amazing platform. And, um, you know, we want to keep that going. And we've talked about what we want to do next. I think we'll take a little bit of a break, and then we'll come we back. We to get all of the books shipped. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a little premature. Yes, we would love to do something else. A lot of what we've been thinking about is how can we make something that's all ages? How can we do something that actually works for the artists in a publishing setting? Because this really was a zine that went completely out of control in the best way possible. <laughs> like, we were like, let's have 12 people, and let's draw Brienne. And like, you know, this is kind of where it went. Um, um, so we're very aware of the platform that we have created, and I think we want to be very um, observant of how we can keep building this, how we can keep making it good, because the core of it and the heart of this is the artists that you see before you and that are in this book. So whatever we do, we want to make sure that you know it's best for them and that we can keep you know making this platform great. And we, we also heard a lot from um, backers who wanted to share these books with uh, nieces, nephews, daughters, sons, you know, everything. Um, so we've been trying to think about how, you know, basically to get this to everyone who wants to see it, you know, spread that message. So, you know, we've been, we're donating to libraries so that people can see it. And we've heard a lot of incredible stories um, from people who are like, you know, I can't even imagine if I had seen this in the library. So it's, it's been very powerful and we want to share that as much as possible. But first let's get the books out there. Really. <laughs> October, we can talk after October. <laughs> Thank you for your question. And we have maybe five minutes left. Yeah. 
Yeah, so there's a, let me get another question. Yeah, oh, go for it. Sasha. Hey, Sasha. Hey, Sasha. <laughs> We're going to up here. <laughs> Shannon, do you know everybody in this room? <laughs> We're all really Sasha, you get the please. While she's walking to the mic, I'm going to try not to embarrass her too much, but she's also an artist uh, in this book. Her name is Sasha. She's amazing. Oh, hello. Um, so uh, I work in book production. Shout out to Katie Kane. I work. I work, used to work for Paper Cuts, production coordinator. I remember Anna in the Cosmic Race. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So I, I think a lot about production a lot. So I was just wondering, like, how did the production of this book uh, start? What was your process? How did you choose like the gilded edges and and the hardcover? We'll see you next year in part two, how to make an anthology. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I mean, that was something that we talked about a lot, just to nutshell it a little bit. Um, at first, we had a few people that were like, yeah, we're going to do this little zine. And we then opened it up on Twitter, who wants to be in the zine? And we had so many people. And we were like, all right, we're going to do like a really big like manga bible size book. It's going to be like crusted edges and crazy. And as this grew and as more people became part of this, we realized it's an organizational nightmare. We don't want to make a phone book. We want this book to have meaning and to have flow. <laughs> so one of, and when you start getting, um, uh, and if anyone who's ever worked in anthology, once you start getting work in, you see that things kind of start sifting into overarching themes. And so um, the number three is a great number, and it was kind of a cool idea to basically put these books into three volumes. And once we had that idea of, like, we can sort things into wisdom, courage, um, fellowship, mm -hmm. that gave us a lot of great, uh, kind of everything fell into place, everything kind of clicked. And we also, um, you know, like, because we were doing nights, we were, you know, thinking about books that were important to us. You know, uh, we were inspired by old books. Um, and we we definitely like went straight to, you know, like beautiful gilded edges, um, which was one of our our. Uh, what would you call it? The stretch goals? Yeah, I mean, the idea, too, was to make something that no one in their right mind would ever publish. Yeah. <laughs> basically, you know, basically like, like, as over the top as possible. And, uh, and we were very lucky that, you know, like, the, we always wanted to do something really special, but um, the, the Kickstarter went so over the top that we were able to add gilded edges. We were able to um, stamp foil on all of the covers, do the boxes, you know, Pantone, everything. So um, Annie and I tend to be a perfect combination of two uh, people without uh, judgment or restriction. <laughs> so we, it was just, you know, like um, one of the best things about working with Annie is so much of our phone conversations were um, just like, oh my god, we should add this and this and this, and yeah. no, no, there was nobody who was like, maybe. Well, Tim in the maybe, background would be like, yeah, mm -hmm. Tim in the background, but we weren't yeah. listening. Yeah. Um, but yeah. you know, like we just, uh, we really went over the top, and we were very lucky that um, both the project and the people that are involved, you know, helped us uh, make these. Basically. And you guys have to like touch these books and see them because like their attention to detail. I think like everybody here when we got our copies was just like, oh my god, I feel like, good. It's, I feel really, really, yeah, I feel really they're good. really I beautiful. Feel the weight <laughs> was totally worth it, and like it just makes such a difference. Like Thank all you. of the detail you guys put in, it's like gorgeous. Oh. When I hold my first child, I'll probably experience. <laughs> <laughs> If you guys in the audience want to come up and touch this book, we can't t stay here for too much longer, but this map right here is your key. Um, please, if you haven't gotten um, a copy already, or if you even have one and you have some spare money, please buy it from these lovely artists. Um, all of the money for the book goes directly to them. Um, and then we also have full sets if you want to come spy our tables and the full sets. Um, but we really, yes, go one, ahead. One quick thing to shout out to you is that artists have read books. Blue books oh, yeah. are at Annie and Kevin's table. Yes, those are like a couple yeah, advanced a few backer, backer editions, editions yeah. that are there. Um, but yes, yeah, so I just want to, in conclusion, thank all of you artists for being here. Thank everyone in this room for being here. It means a lot to us. And again, thank you to SPX. Um, the story of Thousand Whites starts several years ago when we would get together at SPX and meet other artists and dream really big. And so having this safe space for not only us, but now our audience, uh, means the world. So just thank you, everybody. Yeah.